I am uh, delighted to introduce you to Michelle Papiana. Michelle teaches for uh, exercise science and health promotion. So I'm going to turn it over to uh, to Michelle and let her uh, introduce you, give you her background, and uh, hopefully share someone that she's uh, a guest that she has with her. So yes. thank you, Michelle. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Papania. I am an instructor in the College of Science with the uh, Department of Exercise Science and Health Promotion. Uh, my specialty being uh, health promotion. I also have a background um, administrating and providing clinical services to substance dependent individuals. Uh, my mother and I um, managed an, uh, an outpatient uh, clinical uh, re, uh, outpatient rehab and uh, counseling agency, and I'll introduce you to her. This is my mom. Her name is Georgia, also known as Gigi. Hello. And Gigi is a licensed clinical social worker, and she has a few things that she is going to also uh, contribute to our, our session today. Okay, so I'll, I'll turn back, and then when, when Gigi is ready, we'll bring her in. Um, but I just thought I'd start out by, you know, this whole transition to fully online has not only been difficult for us as instructors, but has also been difficult on, on our students. And so our students are uh, certainly needing more help from us, more direction from us, uh, a little bit more understanding from us. So I just wanted to start today's session by asking, have students uh, reached out to you for help? Um, and if so, how have you assisted students who have been in need in help? Uh, have you, what specific accommodations or resources or strategies or suggestions uh, have you made available to these students? So if you've thought about that and if, Dr. Judy, if we have any answers in the chat, I'd love to hear from, from our attendees on, um, or if they'd like to speak, I'd love to hear you know, what, what their thoughts are on this. All right, so again, how are we going to help our students succeed in a fully online environment? So we're all sharing this new reality, right? We have to stay home in order to keep ourselves, our families, our friends, our communities safe and healthy, but this is something that was thrust upon us. This was not something that we are doing by choice. It's something that we need to do. It's a necessity. Um, we've, we've never had to do this before. And so people might think, oh my gosh, how, I'm not gonna be able to do this. How am I gonna be able to do this? And all of these circumstances and feelings can really lead to feelings of loss of control. Um, and, and that loss of control can affect um, our performance in many areas, um, none, not the least of which would be academic performance. Um, so it's a new reality and, and it has the potential to create some, some issues for our students that we need to address. All right, so we're fully online, so now what? So a lot of instructors might say, well, what's the big deal? Don't young people pretty much do everything online anyway? And that's true despite their proclivity for you know, e-everything and, and being on social media and, and using TikTok and, 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 and all of that, Facebook and Twitter. Instagram, not all young people are accustomed to actually learning online. So just because our, our students are used to doing things online doesn't necessarily mean that they're accustomed or used to learning online. It's a, it can be a very different environment and a very scary environment uh, because you're not in a classroom present with uh, an instructor. Um, and, and so, you know, you're missing that one-on-one -on -one connection uh, and so you can feel very alone in that environment. And, and that might be something that students are not used to. Some have never done distance learning before. Some actually prefer to have face-to-face uh, -face connections. They prefer the face-to-face -face environment. Um, and some might be lacking actually the resources that they really need to succeed. Uh, maybe some students are using iPads to take notes, but they don't necessarily have um, cameras uh, that they can can do conferencing with. I mean, it can be all kinds of issues, uh, te technical issues, hardware and software issues, compatibility issues. Uh, and not all of our students are the traditional 20-somethings that are accustomed to doing everything online. 
Uh, when I came back to FAU in 2011 to get my master's degree, it had been um, 15 years uh, since I had stepped foot into a classroom. And, you know, so now I was seeing PowerPoint presentations for the first time and not taking, having to take notes in the traditional way. So some of our older or less traditional students may be completely un unaccustomed to this environment. Uh, because again, our student population is quite diverse. Uh, and not all students are tech savvy. Uh, and so, you know, they have concerns that they're not going to be able to succeed in a fully online environment. So it's easy for us to say, well, you know, this shouldn't be too much of a problem. They're so used to doing all of these things online, but but learning can be something very different from socializing online, uh, like most of our young people are uh, particularly accustomed to doing. All right, so what problems are students having? Well, certainly they are having to adjust to a new learning environment, particularly if this is something that they've never done before. Um, like us, they are definitely lacking uh, a sense of normalcy and a sense of routine, uh, which can definitely interfere with cognition and the learning uh, process. Uh, I know for myself personally, not having a routine, I have to actually think about what day it is. Um, because I'm not having to be at, at a certain place at a certain time in a classroom, you know, giving a, a lecture at one o'clock on a Tuesday or a Thursday. Uh, so there's that lack of normalcy and routine, uh, which can be very detrimental to learning in an online environment because you've got to be pretty self-disciplined. You've got to be able to follow the syllabus and you've got to be able to, to follow instructions. So uh, that, that lack of normalcy can be difficult. Um, certainly students are experiencing personal or familial health issues and financial issues. I actually happen to have a student who is COVID-19 positive. Um, he is a respiratory therapist that works down at one of our Broward County hospitals and uh, became infected working in the hospital, you know, treating patients. And so now on top of everything else that's going on in his life, you know, he's got to deal with personal sickness. Um, as I'm sure other students are, as are they dealing with financial issues uh, from not working or family members not working. Or I've had students whose family members are, are nurses. I have, I have a student whose mom is a nurse and she worries about her mother being in that environment. So there's lots of uh, these worry issues um, that our students are, are having to think about that were not there before. And this can cause stress for sure, some panic, uh, definitely social isolation and loneliness, uh, as well as fear of, of the unknown, right? We, this is all new to us. So, so, you know, how do we deal with something that we've never faced before, that we've never even thought about before? Again, that fear of the unknown can be very powerful. Um, and so I'll, I'll ask any of you who are in attendance, have I missed something in terms of problems uh, that students might be having? Are there any other issues or problems that you guys have come across that I haven't listed here? All right, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about the, the stress response. Uh, I'm not going to go into great detail on this, but what is stress? It's any condition, whether that's physical or emotional, that can threaten what we call homeostasis which is, if you're not familiar with that term, homeostasis, it's, it's the, the ongoing processes of the body that, that helps us to maintain stable internal conditions that are necessary for us not only to, to survive, but to thrive. Um, and this is directly related to our health. When we maintain steady homeostasis, we tend to enjoy good health. When homeostasis gets disturbed, uh, particularly for a long period of time or what we, what we call chronically, that's when we start to have issues with our health. We start to see some of those lifestyle diseases uh, crop up, and that can be uh, very detrimental to our health. So, so we're actually, as a human organism, we're built to withstand what we call acute stress, stress in the short term. We have a threat. We experience a threat or a stressor. 
the stress response actually gives us what we need to respond to that threat. And then presumably that threat goes away and then we, we restore our homeostasis and we get on with our life. We're equipped to do that. Uh, what we're what we're not equipped to do with is to deal with stress on a long term, ongoing, or what we call chronic basis, and that's one of the things that I fear that's going to come out of this is that we're going to have ourselves or our students being stressed for a chronic period of time, and and that's where we start to get into problems, uh, especially with uh, social functioning and with learning. So, so what, then yes. what what then. Um, what might be um, an indication that that would be happening? So I'll go through the stress response and, and, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then if I don't answer the, the question, Dr. Judy, then by all means, we'll ask it again. All right, so um, the, the Selye's, Hans Selye developed uh, the, what he calls the general adaptation syndrome to stress. It re, it's a model that that shows us how our body responds to stress. And you can you know, very, see a very simple graph here. Uh, we start at homeostasis um, in the, and, and as we move forward in time, we see that in our, our alarm stage, our resistance, in the, in, at least in the initial stages of the initial threat or the alarm stage, our resistance goes down, but we, we start to adapt to that and we gain additional resistance. But, and, and we actually peak in what's called the resistance stage. But as time continues to pass, as that response um, becomes more pronounced and prolonged, that's when we start to get into real trouble. All right, so in the acute or the alarm phase, this is the phase where we're actually engaged in and coping with an emergency. These are the short-term changes in our environment. Uh, and what is typically activated is what we call our sympathetic nervous system, our fight or flight response. Um, and we, part of that fight or flight response is the release of stress hormones, in particular epinephrine, which is also known as adrenaline. Uh, and that's really the hormone that dominates in, in the, um, in the uh, alarm phase. And during this phase where the body is mobilizing energy resources and increasing its consumption of energy in order to give us the resources that we need uh, in order to um, meet the threat. Uh, and so physiologically, in indications that you're in the alarm phase would be an increase in heart rate, an increase in blood pressure, you're breathing faster than normal, uh, but you do become more mentally alert, right? So again, the body is giving you what it needs in order to cope with or the stress or meet the challenge of the stress. So that's really the first indication that you are experience, experiencing some, some stress. You know, you can feel your heart rate and your blood pressure. You can feel that, that tension, that increase in mental alert, alertness. And so, that, again, that would be the acute or alarm phase. And our body is very well adapted uh, to, to manage and cope with acute stress. It's not acute stress that's the problem. So the problems start to really come in when we experience chronic stress. And that's when we enter what's called the resistance phase. And this, can per, this is when we can enter this particular phase so we can shift from, we can shift from our, um, whoops, from our acute phase into our chronic or resistance phase, if stress persists for hours, or, or I'm sorry, for, for greater than just a few hours. So a few hours worth of stress would be your acute, but if, we, if stress persists for longer than that, so now we're talking days, weeks, months, even years, you know, we enter the, the resistance phase, and then the, you know, as we're gonna see later on, uh, an even more det detrimental phase. Uh, so in the resistance phase, our energy demands are gonna rate, remain high, and we're gonna continue to experience a release of stress hormones. But unlike the alarm phase where adrenaline or epinephrine is the stress hormone that dominates, now we have a new hormone that starts to dominate and that's cortisol. And cortisol, when, when those, uh, levels of cortisol remain high in our bloodstream for an extended period of time can actually impair our immune function. 
So not only do heart rate and blood pressure and muscle tension remain high, which if your blood pressure and heart rate are elevated for an extended period of time, now we start to get into some cardiovascular issues. But if you're in, in, in experiencing impaired immune function, you know, your ability to combat illness is going to be also impaired. Uh, and that's where sickness starts to come in. Uh, cortisol also interferes with the body's ability to regulate uh, blood, gluco blood glucose levels. So you have abnormal uh, blood glucose regulation. This is why people who are chronically stressed can uh, develop things like type 2 diabetes, right? Because their body is, is not regulating their, their blood glucose levels appropriately. You can actually experience a breakdown of bone tissue and skeletal muscle tissue. And then if you are stressed, uh, very likely you're not eating right. You're probably not sleeping as well as you should be. So poor nutrition, inadequate sleep, and then illness on top of, of that can exacerbate or make all of these conditions worse. Uh, and, and certainly it's going to impair uh, cognition or learning ability, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Any questions at this point? Oh, so Gigi would like to comment. Uh, currently, my client base is approximately 80% of the Palm Beach County School District, primarily teachers. And the teachers in Palm Beach County, for the very first time, are participating in distance learning. And that has created an enormous amount of stress for them, not only for their students, but for them as well. Um, for me, the trigger word that I listen for is worry. I'm worried. And I often work with my clients. Sometimes I, I'm into a lot of visualization. So I will draw a continuum from one to 10. And one, two, three, one through three would be apathy. Ah, oh, no big deal. Um, you know, this is being overblown. I don't need to be concerned uh, so much. That in current day can be very dangerous. At the far extreme, from eight through 10, would be worry. And as Michelle said, worry which is chronic stress, can really wreak havoc with our body and certainly with our mind. Um, some of the signs would be anxiety, depression. Um, I can't sleep. I'm having a hard time sleeping at night. I'm drinking more than I used to just to relax. I'm either not eating or I'm overeating to soothe tension. Um, and when someone is in a worry loop, they're really not able to creatively problem solve. So we need to bring that to the middle, which is your four through seven range. And that's concern. Concern enables us to identify a problem and to creatively problem solve, to look for solutions. Again, I am a, a strong believer that worry is an extremely destructive emotion. Worry never solves a problem. However, concern can help us to solve a problem. So I, I think it's important that we um, tell our clients, our, our students, whatever, that when you find yourself in that worry loop, you need to do whatever it takes to pull it back into the concern range. I'm going to turn it back to Michelle. Gigi, thank you. That was beautiful because that really put everything into perspective for us i i appreciate that your 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 the visual that you created for us thank you so much that's why i wanted her here today because i knew she'd be able to do that for us 
Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, and, and obviously, you know, we as educators feel this, but our students are also feeling this as well. And it's, it's important for us to, to understand that just as the, the behaviors that, that Gigi uh, talked about, um, that, you know, people in that worry loop experience, you know, including us, our students are experiencing the same thing. All right. And then just lastly, very quickly, uh, you know, we move from from our resistance phase into our exhaustion phase. This is where the body actually experiences breakdown of homeostatic regulation, right? So the body is no longer able to cope with stressors uh, and that's due to depletion of the body's resources. Our, our energy needs have remained high and we've depleted our energy resources. And unless corrective action is taken, disease is going to be inevitable. Uh, again, cardiovascular disease due to chronically elevated heart rate and blood pressure, diabetes due to uh, um, the inability of the body to, to properly regulate blood glucose, infections due to impaired immune system, cancer, the same thing, uh, musculoskeletal diseases because, um, you know, cortisol um, breaks down our bone tissue and, and mental illness, as Gigi alluded to. All of those things can can result, and obviously, the, in the extreme, death can follow. So, you know, we may we may think that you know we're equipped to handle stress in the long term, but we we really aren't. We're very good at handling or or managing, you know, an acute stressor, but it's the chronic stress that that where we run into a problem. All right. So, how does all of this tie into what we're talking about today, which is online learning? Well, we know that stress affects cognitive function, which is uh, basically our ability to learn. And the effects of stress on cognition depend on a couple of variables. How intense the stress is, is it mild stress, is it moderate stress, is it very intense stress? The duration of, it, of stress, so now we get into those words that we were just talking about, acute versus chronic. And then the source of the stress. Is it in, intrinsic stress or task-specific stress? So if I'm a student and I'm taking a, an exam, I'm going to experience some intrinsic uh, stress. That is stress that I'm going to feel because I'm in the middle of taking a test. Again, that's typically a very acute form of stress um, that we're going to, the body is going to rev up. We're going to be able to manage that stress. We're probably, it's probably actually going to even enhance our ability to do well on that test. And then once we are done taking the test, it's done. The real problem is the extrinsic, uh, tra uh stressors, right? Those stressors that are actually outside of the task itself. And really that's the current circumstance. So the current circumstances of, of being forced to do distance learning, of being forced to socially distance, um, those are extrinsic stressors that simply add to, you know, the task-specific stress that stresses that we might experience on uh, a daily basis. And, you know, we've been experienced that experiencing these stresses for a number of weeks, and they're going to continue to be felt for many, many more weeks uh, to come. Very good. I just, um, my comment was to say that it was a very good overview of what happens, especially when dealing with uh, chronic stress. And by being sensitive to it, we can take the necessary measures to personally address our own chronic stress, because mm -hmm. we too are stressed, and identify when to step in and help the students as they go through this change. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think you made an extremely good point. You know, I, I think I think of, you know, what they tell you to do on an airplane. If the oxygen mask deploys, put yours on first and then help somebody next to you. So we have to understand and our own stressors and manage our own stress before we can actually be there to effectively assist our students. So I really appreciate that comment. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to point out that, you know, chronic um, and or high to extremely high stress is really what is going to uh, inhibit our, our students' ability to learn. Because chronic or high to extremely high stress um, impairs 
explicit memory formation. So what is explicit memory? So those are the, the facts, the events, the meanings that we ascribe to those facts and events, the context or the concepts behind those facts and those meanings. Um, you know, and that's obviously all very tied to learning. It's also things like remembering dates and time. You know, um, I, I had a student who said, you know, oh my gosh, I can't believe I, I knew we, we had an exam coming up and I just completely forgot. You know, again, it, it's hard because of our lack of routine and normalcy. It's so easy to, to forget what day it even is. And so, you know, if you're not, if you're having difficulty recalling appointments or times of, of, of events like exams, it would be so easy for a student to miss that and, 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 and be completely um, innocent, not meaning to do that. Um, you know, so assignment due dates, all of these. So, so it's not only learning information, but just remembering when and how to submit these assignments in an online format. All of those things can be impaired when students are experiencing chronic or high to extremely high stress. Um, so it's important for us to, to, to remember that um, and to try to work uh, with our students about that. All right, so what can we do for students? So what are some, some, some student success strategies? So I've got a couple of different um, categories here. So what can we do to help them academically, to encourage them, to help them maintain good health? And then overall, what can we do for our students? Hi, Kimberly. Um, my observation or my comment was just that it is extremely difficult for me to assess the level of stress that my students may be experiencing because I'm just using the audio feature in Big Blue Button when I do meet with them once a week. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering, you know, what could you offer us as instructors as ways of detecting stress? And then I find that very few students will reach out and send me emails, you know, because I might be able to up clues in an email correspondence with students. But other than that, it's very hard for me. And all I do is whenever I communicate with them via announcement or like emails to the entire, you know, student enrollment, is I try to make sure that I always mention the availability of the counseling and psychological services center, you know, mm -hmm. such that they know that that option exists. Right, right. So a couple of things that come to mind, you know, when you when you make your announcements or you send out your emails, um, you know, you might want to just include a sentence at the end that you're available to talk if students are having a particular issue or you invite um, students to reach out if they are having difficulty in one way or another so that, you know, you can if it's in the course or in other ways so that you can refer them to the uh, appropriate uh, services. You can also monitor their performance. Uh, if you have a student who was a very good performer, if they were con consistently turning in assignments on time, if those assignments were high quality, now all of a sudden you're starting to see that they're, you know, turning things in late or the quality of their work work is slipping, that would be another indication uh, without them actually coming out and saying to you that, hey, I'm having a problem. It might be an indication that they are having difficulty. They're just not, they're just not making it apparent to you. So certainly a change in their academic behavior or in the quality of their assignments, that would definitely be uh, a clue to work for or, or, or to look for rather. Did you have anything in, in addition? Yeah, just a, uh, a very brief questionnaire to your students on anxiety and depression. Are they experiencing any of the telltale signs? Um, you know, also, I think pointing out to students, all humans experience fear of the unknown. That is a universal feeling. But it's one more thing that's on a continuum. Some people experience it very little. They're able to 
confront the fear, work through it, and move on. And then at the, the far other end, there are people who are totally immobilized. It can completely shut down, uh, shut a person down. Very important, particularly right now, to point out to your students that while it's important to plan, it is equally as important to live in the present day. Um, planning occurs in the concern phase. Projection occurs in the worry phase. Projection is almost always negative. So teaching students to recognize when they've gone into that worry phase, when they are projecting rather than planning and developing skills to pull themselves back to what I call the middle of the road. And can you just explain what projecting is? Projecting is conjuring up an outcome in your head. Again, we all want to know what's around the next corner. And so sometimes to fulfill that need, we'll come up with scenarios, usually very catastrophic or negative. And I think we all have to remember that as stressful as all of this is, most present moments are okay. Does that help your question? Thank you. And I would also say that to some extent, like standardized, standardization would be good. So instead of each instructor having to like independently come up with a survey, like to assess anxiety levels, if there could be like a five item instrument <laughs> that yep. were developed and then include it among the teaching resources that well, we have. That would be extremely useful, I would think. And yeah, it's interesting that you say that. I was just thinking when she said sort of a, a, a survey, I thought, you know, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we all did like an extra credit quiz on Canvas with that sort of a survey instrument and, and, and give that to students um, to, and to get an idea. Is that something we can develop? Yeah, yeah we, we can develop that and, and, and we'll definitely put that out. And it's something you could make, take five minutes to do a quick Canvas quiz for. And thank you for that, Michelle. That's a great plan. We also had a similar type of thing that Nancy Shahada uh, mentioned. Uh, do we want to open Nancy's mic up and let her uh, make a response to? Hi, everyone. Um, I'd like to begin by saying what a great topic to cover um, with everything going on. I actually work with a lot of the faculty in the College of Business, um, helping them transition their courses from the face to face to online this semester. And um, this was a big topic. And I really liked um, whoever mentioned the keeping an eye, kind of an eye out for the word worry. And um, that was definitely the case with a lot of the faculty I was, um, you know, working with. But what I wanted to say regarding um, the students and trying to connect with them, you know, their stress levels and such. And if you don't have a... Um, you know, one way I do it and what I did last week with my students is I did kind of like a checking in announcement. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this way, you know, the idea was just for everybody to kind of share and comment on the announcement, check in, let me know how you're doing. Um, there weren't any points allotted for the students that responded or anything, but the idea was to kind of get everybody to um, open up and share about their experiences regarding you know, the pandemic, how it has impacted their life, um, just to make them feel a little more comfortable. I know that a lot of the students definitely felt this big change of going from face-to-face -to, -face to online, and um, a lot of them weren't so happy about it. So I felt mm -hmm. like that announcement kind of it helped me get a better idea of my class and, and what they're experiencing. And Nancy, did you get uh, did you get responses from the majority of your students? 
I did. I did. You know, I'm teaching a graduate course and I really appreciated the way they all kind of jumped in. I had sent it out, I think on Wednesday or Thursday, and I noticed a lot of them responded over the weekend. Um, And, you know, I'd never done that honestly before in my class. You know, I usually teach graduate level and, you know, we've never had something like this happen before. So I never even thought of uh, doing a checking in announcement, but I heard one of the faculty in, I think it was the Wednesday faculty lounge, the live faculty lounge that they had uh, mentioned this, you know, option. And I'm like, you know what, let me try it out. And it actually worked out really well. That's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. And, 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 you know, I, I think doing sorts of those sorts of things or even just posting a little quiz sort of as a a stress assessment, those are awesome tools that we can uh, certainly all use. So I appreciate your sharing that. And I'm glad that your students actually responded. Uh, but just some some strategies uh, to to maybe think about in terms of helping your students. So academically encouraging them to check their syllabi often. Again, when you're stressed, it, it can be so easy to forget a date. You know, you're keeping all this stuff in your head. And normally when you're not under stress, you know, you remember those things. But once stress comes in, you know, the ability to remember things uh, easily goes out the door. So, you know, reminding them to check their syllabi often, talk to the instructors, um, and also encourage them to begin the coursework early. Um, because if they, you know, if they wait to the last minute, which so many of them are apt to do, and they run into a technical issue, which is something that is inherently different with online than it is with turning things in in a face to face environment. Um, they don't have time to to rectify those issues, or it may just add additional stress. So I encourage students to begin all of their co- coursework early, so that they, if they run into issues, there's adequate time to to um, to deal with those issues. Emphasize time management. Make sure that you're prioritizing. Uh, appropriately. And it's okay to say no, you know, if you've got too much on your plate and some, somebody is asking something of you and, and you, you don't feel that you can do it, it's okay to say no. Sometimes we have to do that in order to take care of ourselves. And then encouraging students to use the, the available resources. Canvas is there. The help desk is there. The Center for Learning and Student Success. The e-learning, right? And, and most importantly, it's okay to ask for help. Right. We're all human. We all need help. And right now is a time when we really should be leaning on one another. So important to ask for help, Um, helping them to focus on overall health, whether that's physical health, mental or emotional health, spiritual health, because it's all connected, making sure that they are engaging in appropriate self-care. So they're getting enough sleep. They're eating properly. They're exercising, which, by the way, I also have to just mention because I'm in exercise science that regular um, uh, low intensity to moderate intensity exercise helps the body to clear those levels of cortisol. That's the stress hormone that wreaks havoc on our our body. So when you engage in regular exercise activity, and it doesn't have to be high intensity, preferably it should be low to moderate intensity, that helps to clear the body of that stress hormone. Making social connections, and I know we're doing that in a new way, but making those social connections, even if we have to do it virtually rather than face-to-face, engaging in meaningful activities, engaging in prayer and meditation, and, and being grateful, having that attitude of gratitude, being grateful for what we do have rather than focusing on the problems. Uh, and then just the simple act of breathing, if you can just t- take a minute to breathe in and out very deeply for 60 seconds. That tends to engage the parasympathetic nervous system, our our nervous system that brings us back to homeostasis. And then lastly, creating normalcy. Establishing, encourage your students to establish a routine, stick to it, be patient with yourself, with others, engage in those safe behaviors that we've been talking about, stay informed. Um, having a sense of humor, which is really important. And then the, the serenity prayer, accepting the things that you can't change, but changing the things that you can. Um, 
really, really important. And then the rest of this uh, PowerPoint is really more about resources. Uh, just remembering that it's important to get information from reliable sources, and these resources will be going out to you. Um, Dr. Judy, I don't want to go too fast. Do, do we want to save this for another follow-up? Um, it might be a good idea, although we definitely are going to be uh, sharing these resources out to everyone. Okay. We had someone ask about the, uh, the slide you had with the uh, tips for student success. So... Um, yeah, so this PowerPoint slide is definitely going to be shared with everybody. Yes, and so we are, like, within about two or three minutes, I'm going to uh, maybe suggest if there's anybody that has any questions that we haven't responded to or um, anything that you want to add into the conversation, and then uh, then I think we probably will want to invite Michelle and Gigi to come back and join us in a couple of weeks and and do some follow-up on it. That would be great. And in the meantime, we will work on just a very brief sort of anxiety survey, and we can include that. Super. So that, so that you know, uh, our instructors have a tool to try to evaluate, you know, the stress and the anxiety that their students are actually feeling. What a great idea. What a great idea. Um, so, um, if you would maybe go to that slide where you've showed the resources, although we're going to we're going to send it out as well. Yeah. Now. So if we if we sort of go through, I've got a slide on on resources, uh, and again, so we see the Canvas support hotline, we see the Center for E Learning, the Center for Learning and Student Success, Counseling and Psychological Services, as well as the Help Desk, and then I also want to go back to. Uh, FAU's coronavirus website, if we can click on that, this has all kinds of resources that we see here um, that students can use. This is a, a great website. So we get Dr. Kelly's updates, which are then added to this website. But this particular website has lots of resources for faculty, staff, for students, and, and so I encourage you to share this website with your students. Beautiful. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you for uh, for bringing the lovely Gigi along with you. Say goodbye. <laughs> thank you. It was a pleasure. Oh, it, it is. It is our pleasure. Believe me, we truly appreciate what you what you are doing and, and your words of wisdom. I I. Uh, I saw myself in a couple of your comments, so I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the fact that you can recognize it is, is the good news, Judy. Yeah, right. I guess so. I guess so. At least I don't have my head completely buried in the sand, right? Exactly. exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. And um, we'll, uh, we will... Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We will send this information out to you. Michelle has a wonderful list of, of, uh, of the PDF with her resources. And, and we will uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Obviously, there is a need for this information and a need for the, the calming perspective of Michelle and Gigi. Thank <laughs> you so much for joining us today.